Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Safety Chain's Leadership Series and today's topic, Get Ready for FISMA, special guest speaker, Dr. Dave Atchison. And of course, we know this is a topic near and dear to all of your hearts, and so we'd like to also wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. My name is Barbara Levin. I'm Safety Chain's SVP of Marketing and a co-founder. I'll be your host today as well as one of your presenters. Before we begin, let me give you some important housekeeping information. If you require technical assistance at any time during today's webcast, you have two options. Uh, being hosted on this webcast today by WebEx, you can call 1-775-09-3239, again, 877-509-3239, uh, for technical assistance, if you have dropped out of the event and for some reason you can't get back in, if you're in the event and you have uh, questions, um, you can simply go to the question tab and send the chat, and then the producer will automatically get it. If you have a drop down uh, bar at the top of your screen, there is an arrow on the right hand side. Click on the arrow, and it will bring you to the Q&A box, and you can simply enter um, your technical question there and hit send in the Q&A box. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're having audio problems, um, you can go off of your uh, computer speakers and use the call-in number that was provided in your confirmation email. Everybody who's registered for today's event will get a copy of the slides as well as a recording link of the event. You'll receive an email within 24 hours that will allow you to download the audio and the slides. We'll be taking questions at the end of the presentations. If you have questions for David or myself, you can enter them at any time by going to that same box, hit arrow on the right hand side of the drop down toolbar at the top of your screen. You'll see a box with a question mark in it. Click that and that way we'll have your questions queued up for the end, or you can simply wait until the end of the event and uh, enter your questions there. We'll be going out on a full screen. Um, for your privacy, you can see the names of our panelists and producers today, as well as uh, your own name. Um, we've, we've got close to 1,000 people registered for the event today, and um, for privacy, reasons we do not show the names of the other attendees but we're so glad that so many of you have been able to join us. Our agenda today um, is going to start with looking at the key provisions of the new rules, the Vented Control and Produce Rule, impact on the food industry, how to prepare for the new rules, leveraging technology for compliance, um, then we'll be coming back and we'll just uh, give a high-level overview of how Safety Chain can help you with your FISMA compliance, and then we'll take your questions. At that, I'm very excited to introduce today's special guest speaker, Dr. David Atchison. Uh, you see some of the highlights of David's career here on the screen, but additionally, and, and perhaps most relevant to today, um, Dave was responsible for the 2007 Food Protection Plan that formed the foundation for the Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011. He was so involved in the drafting of the law, so we're very, very lucky to have him here today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. David Atchison. Welcome to today's webinar, and you should have the ball now. Thank you, Robert. It's a great pleasure to be on with you again, and, and um, welcome to everybody who's, who's joined us today to talk about the, um, some of the two most important proposed rules in the Food Safety Modernization Act. What I want to do over the course of the next half hour or so is, is to give you a high-level view of the two rules that are currently sitting there for comment, the prevention rule and the produce rule. And look at it through the lens of things that you should be thinking to start to do right now. We all know the proposed rules. They're not final rules. We have some time. Hopefully, during the course of the next 30, 35 minutes, you'll realize that there are things you should be doing right now, if you're not already, that can you to make this pretty seamless. 
And even though these are proposed rules, my personal view is, is that much of it will not change in the final rule. Some things will. I'd like to focus on those areas where I think we won't see much change to give you a sense of things that you should begin to think about right now if you're not, not already. As you all know, this was signed into law just over two years ago. It is a massive shift in the food safety system in the United States. It reflects essentially an integrated global systems approach. It recognizes, FDA recognizes that that have to regulate a global food supply in the context of protecting American consumers. And, and the new law and the new regulations um, are reflective of that. The place to start is, number one, who's covered? In to the prevent control rules, which we're going to talk about first. What, if you're familiar with the, with the law, was what was Section 103 in the FISMA, and about a month ago, FDA came out with a series of proposed rules around preventive control requirements. So in terms to, of, of myself, well, do I need to pay attention to these? There's a few questions that you need to, to ask, ask yourself. First is, am I required to register with FDA under the Bioterrorism Act? That's Section 415 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This is not new. It is part of the, um, uh, of the old BT Act. And essentially, it applies to anybody who's manufacturing, processing, um, holding um, food. So that's changed. So if you check that box and say, yeah, I know I need to register, and if you're not sure, then, then we can help you that out. But as you know, the next thing to do is to sort of ask whether you're domestic or imported. And if, if, it, if way, it doesn't matter. If you're required to register, then you are required to pay attention to these new rules. So it is global. Having said that, there are a series of exemptions which will exclude certain people or certain sections of some parts of the industry. So let's dive just a second into what some of those exemptions are. So you have to register. So then we're down to, am I exempt? Well, the first exemption is that if you have to comply with the juice and seafood HACCP programs, you are exempt from these preventive control rule requirements because you're already essentially adopting preventive control strategies. If you're a farm, as defined currently by FDA, you're, you're exempt. Certain low-risk manufacturing, practice, uh, processing, packing, holding activities that are conducted by small and very small businesses on farms for specific foods that are also exempt. Low-acid canned food food, manufacturer, processor, you're exempt, <clears throat> and registered with the Treasury regarding alcoholic beverages, you're exempt. Goes on. If you're in the supplement industry, you're exempt. And the reason for that, and this is an important one if anybody who's on this call is part of that industry, is you are exempt from is this part of the preventive control rule because the dietary supplement industry is already under GMP rules that came out several years ago, is really focusing on controlling risk in the manufacturing facility. But that industry, pay attention to the rest of FISMA because it does apply to you. It's just this one part that does not. If you are a warehouse, you may be an exempt. Unless you store from vegetables or other foods that require time temperature control. So if you're a warehouse and you are simply moving around packaged goods that are sealed, they're not temperature sensitive, so they're not for produce, then you're, you're exempt. If they are temperature sensitive, in other words, this is about controlling microbial risk. This is about controlling hazards in foods. So some warehouses will, will be in, some warehouses will be out, and some warehouses will do both. So if you do both, then let's give you a warehouse that is, that is focused on products that are require time temperature control. You will have to have a food safety plan Around, around that for the preventive control requirements. And there's modified requirements for small, we find currently is less than 500 employees, and very small, which is actually to be determined, but that's based on dollars, and currently FDA is asking for comment whether that cutoff should be 250,000 a year in sales or a million in sales or somewhere in the middle. So there are modified requirements for, for small companies. So again, lots of exemptions check through and see whether you are in or whether you are out in terms of having to move forward on this. This 
slide is really the, the summary of how this all works. What control rules are all about developing a food safety plan that is focused on risk-based preventive control thinking. And I'm you on this call. I think, well, a HACCP plan, that's risk-based, that's preventive. Am I good to go? The answer is you're part way good to go, but not 100% good to go. The way I describe the thing in the preventive control rule, think of it as like HACCP on steroids. It is double beyond HACCP. And I'm sure many of you are now scratching your head and thinking, what does he mean? And I'll explain in, in a couple of slides what I mean in more detail. Go around this loop. We start with a conventional hazard analysis. More to come in, an, in, a, in the next slide. Then you, once you've done that, you know where my hazards are, and you institute preventive controls in those areas where you need to control risk. You have to monitor that those goals are working. You have develop a series of corrective actions. So you've already preempted some things that could go wrong. If I'm running on a cook step as a preventive control and the cook fails, what do I do? It's written, documented in your food safety plan. You have to think that the system is working on an on basis and then periodically do a reanalysis. If everything's working perfectly well, you have to do the reanalysis every couple of years. And if something pops up that is unexpected, that trigger a reanalysis. And a part to this is that box in the middle about documentation. If you don't document it, you didn't do it. And that's really important. And as you see, record keeping is, is an, an integral and really critical part of where this is all headed. So let's dive down a layer. What's required? I've talked about preventive controls. It is all about preventive controls. It's not just simple HACCP. It's process controls. It's allergen controls, it's about sanitation controls, and there's a requirement for you to have a recall plan. These that I don't believe are going to change. They're in the proposed rule. I see no reason that they would change. So as of today, if you're not already, start to think about this. Start to think about how you're going to control, identify and control risks in these various areas. I've already mentioned verification. This is validation of the preventive controls, calibration of the systems, Ongoing review of the records. So we'll dive down one more layer. What are we thinking about for the hazard analysis? As I said earlier, is this just the same as, as HACCP? And my view is that no, it's not quite the same. But if you have a HACCP plan, certainly don't throw it out and start over. It's going to form a very robust start to the building of your food safety plan. So what to do? Number one, Think about identifying all the potential hazards associated with each type of food you manufacture. And the word potential, an emphasis on the words each type of food. So if you're factoring five different types of food, to think about the hazards in those five different types of food. And we're talking here potential hazards. All those potential hazards. Step one. So make sure you're thinking of biological, chemical, which are the ones we always do, and he's now added radiological. Well, thinking there, well, this is an unusual twist, and a view of that is they're probably thinking about circumstances where the groundwater is potentially contaminated with radioactive material or ingredient source from a part of the world where there has been some nuclear event. I think it's a relatively simple box to check, but it's certainly got people scratching their heads more in terms of what does that mean. do not include intentional. There is no need you're thinking about these preventive controls to be thinking about bioterrorism, food defense. That's going to come later in a subsequent rule. So don't worry about that just yet in the context of your food safety plan. We've got our potential hazards to my first bullet. We thought various areas. Then determine if each hazard is reasonably likely to occur. Thinking about what's the severity of the illness, and what's the foreseeable use of the food? Is it going to be eaten by high-risk population, children, whatever? And what variety of the illness? If that is reasonably likely after this, so this is HACCP type thinking, identify implement preventive controls, process controls, environmental controls, and allergen controls. And finally, these controls have to be sufficient to assure the food isn't adulterated under the FDNC Act. So this is different from 
passive. Well, let me an example of somebody who is operating in a peanut facility. We've seen problems with peanut facilities in the last few years. And I simply as an example of one that I find easy to explain, and hopefully you'll, you'll track with me as I talk, talk about this. I have to eat my peanuts. They come in as a raw product. I roast them, I grind them, and then I put them in a jar and sell them as peanut butter. Simple process. Compassive thinking would say, my critical control point is my roaster. I need to make sure it's validated, it's operating to the right temperature, the right speed, etc., etc. Passive thinking. What F expects you to do is to say, hmm, as I look at the process, my roaster is a risk that I need to control, but I also have a risk in my ready to eat area. I'm the product and then I'm conveyed to distance and then putting it in a jar. I have environmental risk where salmonella is reasonably likely to occur and get into the product. It's happened. We know that. So the now expects you to think of that as a risk in relation to the preventive controls that you have to pay attention to, which is why it's not just straight HACCP. Likewise, if on an adjacent line you're assessing an allergen that's not peanuts, dairy product, something like that, then you need to be thinking about cross-contamination and allergen controls. Is that a risk that's reasonably likely to occur? This is where this differs a little bit from, from HACCP. It's a, it's a bit complicated, but hopefully you begin to understand where it, where it is I'm driving on that. So what in all this, this hazard analysis? We, we then have to identify the parameters needed to control a hazard. And as I've just said, this is not necessarily exactly the same as a CCP. They are going to be a little, a little different. That we choose have to be effective. Effective. Well, it finds effective. What does that mean? You rely on published studies, or you can do an independent, scientifically valid study of your own. But the food safety plan, you want to document that the control that you have picked is effective in doing the job. Then briefly earlier, you also need a recall plan as part of the preventive control. FDA is going to make this a requirement in terms of having a recall plan. So I have an analysis, set up my preventive controls, I'm moving along, the next key step is to monitor what's happening. To establish written procedures to monitor each one of these preventive controls. The purpose is to provide an early warning to you to correct deviation before it becomes a problem and to allow corrective action. This ring needs to be frequent enough to provide assurances that the controls are consistent. I mean that when you've got an oven running all day on separate batches, you show up once with a clipboard and check it's it's working. You need to do this at a frequency that, that will allow you and the FDA or whoever is looking at these data to say, oh, yeah, this cook step is, is working well. And frankly, if you can do continuous monitoring and track it electrically, so much the better. Your written record of that monitoring activity. Observation specific measurements, like the actual temperatures, not just check the box, we're in spec. That won't work. Specific measurements. Then it didn't happen. Once again, if you didn't document, you didn't do it. So we're ready about corrective actions. We're talking about preventive controls. It should implement written corrective action and procedures. So back to my uh, peanut example. The things that I know could go wrong is my oven may stop working. I, uh, something may go wrong with my temperature control. What's the corrective action if that happens? You can detect that easily, and you have a documented approach to correcting that problem. So with the deviation, you take the corrective action, and guess what? You document it. The correction has to ensure that the deviation has been evaluated for food safety. And to document it. Here's what happened. Here's evaluation. Again, my simple example of roasting a nut. We, we're, at, we're out of spec with our temperature. We've got active action. Our corrective action is to correct the problem and to re-roast the product. That way we have addressed the safety side of it. Simple example, but I think it serves the purpose. And, and explicitly, all food affected by the deviation is assumed adulterated until you prove it otherwise. So corrections are going to be important. In terms of 
you've got to validate the adequacy of the preventive controls. As I mentioned earlier, this is about science. This is about either public studies or your own studies. Verif verification that they are being implemented. So verify that that, that is operating at the appropriate temperature. Preventive controls must be validated by a qualified individual. This whole discussion in and of itself is what a qualified individual is, but it's very clear from FDA that there is an expectation that the person overseeing the implementation of this process is qualified to do it either through training or through experience. Verification has got to include monitoring of records, and all this has to be documented. We need record keeping requirements. They've got currently with the activity. In other words, you can't go back and fill out the, the log the next day or later at the, at the end of the shift. It has to be concurrent with the activity, real time. It has in actual values and observations, as said earlier. It can occur, but in the proposed rule, it, it can also be electronic. But if it is, there is a proposal that it be subject to 21 CFR Part 11, which is created. It's new in the food space. Anybody who's in the medical device space will be familiar with this. And essentially, it's to do with authentication of electronic data. You've got to keep these records for at least two years, and six months of those must be available on site. Now, my belief of that is that you must be able to have access to them from site. In other words, you actually have to have a bunch of filing cabinets or a server on site. I think it's perfectly acceptable to have records in the cloud that you can download at the click of a mouse if you need to. And if, if FDA shows up, want to see them, you have, you have to show, show them to them. So that was a, was a very high level overview of the preventive control requirements around the principles of the analysis, the preventive controls, the monitoring, the record keeping, the corrective action. Now is switch gears about produce rules. It relates obviously to produce, um, explicitly in the title, so that's what we're going to talk about. So this is fo this focused on farms. We were manufacturing, processing, holding facilities, distribution places. Now we're on the farm. Keeple is to consider the risk posed by the practices. It's got to be risk-based. Interestingly, FDA in their preamble said, we know that chemical physical are potential problems in fresh produce, but we, we, FDA, believe that microbial contamination is the main area that needs control. So these rules are about controlling microbial contamination. Our agency doesn't care about the others, they do. But to be compliant with this, these new produce rules, it's about microbes. It includes certain types of produce that are rarely consumed raw, and it takes produce that's commercially processed. But you document. Back to my example. I'm going to go go back to my peanut example because I think it serves the purpose. I'm a peanut grower. A product to a roasting operation. Right? I'm growing a product that is going to be commercially processed. My peanuts. That I don't have to comply with these rules. That's the way I interpret it. So I have documented that my peanuts are being um, adequately processed. So included from from that from that perspective. So there's many there's many nuances as you'll see in a second. Flexibility built into this in terms of of size of the operation. There's a whole load of variances, and there are some alternatives. So it can get quite complex, but I will attempt to keep it pretty simple for the purposes of discussion. Essentially, if you are in on produce, here are things that you need to focus on. This microbes, again, remember, it's microbes. And FDA expects you to essentially have risk-based preventive controls that address um, intrusion by domesticated and wild animals, number one. Control risk around equipment, tools, buildings, and sanitation, number two. Have a worker health and hygiene, number three. To pay attention to the quality, the agricultural water you're using from a microbial perspective, number four. To have appropriate growing, harvesting, packing, and holding activities, number five. And to create biological soil amendments, i.e. the use of, uh, of compost, etc. A very specific set of requirements for sprout growers, which I'm not going to go into. Those is first ones which will apply to anybody who is in on the produce safety rule. Who is in? Who is covered? Farms that grow, harvest, pack, or hold most produce in rural or natural states. 
raw, otherwise known as raw agricultural commodities. If you're a farm or mixed type facility, you're covered. It doesn't matter whether you're domestic or foreign, if you fill, fit into this group, you're covered. If you are a farm that sells more than $25,000 per year in sales, you're covered or at least potentially covered. So that's where you start. And if you think, oh, I'm covered, well, am I now exempt? Kind of odd way to doubt it. But in it, are you in or you're out? And not as simple. Exempt. Well, if you, if you produce um, on farm for your own personal or on farm consumption, you're exempt. It's something that's not, not a raw agricultural commodity, and that's defined in the rules. Don't have time to go into that. But if you are producing something like that, you're out. Use that's rarely consumed raw, and FDA has provided a list of what that, that looks like. You're out. Use that will receive commercial processing, and this is my peanut example I gave earlier. I, I grow peanuts, but they're roasted commercially. Takes care of the microbial hazards. I'm out. If I'm small, I'm out. And there is a an area of what's uh, what's a little bit gray in terms of um, those who have modified requirements. Doesn't mean you're exactly in. Does it? Doesn't mean you're exactly out either. And for those of you who have tracked FISMA, this is essentially what the tester amendment was all about. And it's farms that have less than half a million dollar sales within a certain geographic region and sell to qualified end users such as consumers, retailers, and restaurants. So this one's a bit complicated where there are modified requirements as opposed to a clear in or out. And there's some complexity in, in the exemptions. What to do now in the last five or so minutes that I have is to some time talking about how you prepare, how you begin to approach this. I've got of ground very quickly and there's vast amounts of detail in here that obviously I haven't covered because the purpose of this was to give you the, the level of overview of the two rules. So to track back, we have got the, the systems where we need to assess the risk in our manufacturing and processing facilities and the preventive controls, implement them, monitor them, keep the records. Likewise on the farm. I'm, I read the rules or I've understood what, I, what it is and I'm in. And I need to think about all of these things that's about the animal encroachment, the water quality, the agricultural use, the hygiene of my workers, the equipment sanitation, all of those various components. How do I prepare? What do I do? My first message is if you started to prepare, start right now is plenty of these rules which will not change. The thing is such that, that I think we won't see a final rule for at least a year, and then there'll be at least a year likely before compliance kicks in. That means that you don't begin today. You could do need to begin today. And I will explain why, because it's not just about compliance, it's about protecting your brand. So now you want to create a FISMA team if you don't already have one. Remember, that what I talked about with preventive controls is a per-facility approach. You cannot develop a corporate food safety plan and roll it out. You create a corporate template, but a facility specific. So that is going to allow you to start to do this. Spend understanding how these regs apply to you. Obviously, to qualify for an exemptions, and if so, what and how. And really get to the bottom of what you need to do around the things that I've talked about. Then how far you are from being compliant. You do a gap analysis. Well, you have a hazard plan. Might it cover all of the things that could happen? Radiological. Relation to the allergen controls and the environmental controls. Do we have a recall plan? It's an conventional gap analysis. What have we got and where do we need to be? So you're in your HACCP plan and your SOPs and see the gap are. Examine your environmental program and your allergen control program. Where we need to be. Do you, and as I said, do you have a recall plan? I've advised heavily the record keeping part of this. So you need to look at your record keeping system. The, the, the image, if you didn't document it, you didn't write it down, you didn't do it, is very real. I say, but it's very, very true. So look at your record keeping system and ask yourself some questions. Are you capturing the key data elements that document your process control, allergens, environment? 
process. Are you keeping the data in an appropriate way? Are you doing a checklist or have you got real data? The capacity to be able to capture that data electronically, direct download, so it takes the human error out of it. If you can, that's great because it allows you to do other things like trending and look at points where you're beginning to go off the tracks rather than later. Ask yourself, can technology help reduce errors? Simplify the system. I'm a firm believer that technology can help us do that. I'll say that in a second. Look at your training program. It's about training, but there's a great emphasis in both the preventive control rule and the use rule about making sure that workers are trained in what to do. For a specific part in the produce rule, it expects workers not just to be trained to identify problems, to know what to do about it. Training is going to be an important part. So do you have a good training pro program? Let's speak briefly about the return on investment. Is FISMER just a pure cost center? Is there anything in it that, that be helpful? Come to your CFO, your CEO, and say, hey, boss, I need some cash because I need to implement FISMER. Well, you can just do that, but I'd like to suggest that, that the components of the FISMA requirements are actually smart food safety thinking. They're smart best practices. They are the way to go, frankly. Rebrand's your biggest asset. And because of that, it's your greatest risk. We're in an environment today where social media, mainstream media, consensus can put somebody out of business. I want that to happen. You need to protect your brand. And preparedness is the best way to do exactly that. You have problems. You want to control risk. And many leading food companies do that on an ongoing basis. And it's a struggle. I know that. Those leading companies are going to have very little trouble being compliant with FISMA because they're thinking that way. That's the culture. That's what they're doing. Others, not there yet. The data capture and trending, that to me is the key to staying in front. If you don't know what's going on in your facility, you can stay out in front. How many people, and I won't ask for a show of hands on a webinar, but how many people say, well, we never find listeria in environmental testing? We feel good about that. Well, I would push back and say, are you looking in the right place? Are you doing enough testing? Are you using the right test? So you want to know. You want to know what's going on. is strength. So data. Trend your data. You want to know when things are beginning to trend off the rails, way, way before they cause a problem. Developing preventive control thinking, which first and foremost is about protecting your brand and secondly is about compliance with the new Food Safety Modernization Act. I do too in synergy. And oddly I'd say brand protection is more important than compliance in terms of business survival. So technology help. You bet. We're talking information, we're talking about data, we're talking about systems. Leverage technology as a solution for press control, for supply chain control, results, consumer complaints, product tracking. This is all stuff that people are tracking already. And you're going to need to continue to track it and build off it and trend it and get out in front. That's a ton of work if you're doing it all on paper. So technology do the work for you. Let it alert you to aberrant trends. Let us do that. So you hear the one in a million event where something's not right. You have to sift through tons of normal data because if you're anything like me, you will miss the aberrant data point and let an electronic alert that something has gone out of spec. So you use alerts to situations that go out of spec. And you will maintain all these records for FISMA compliance anyway. So let do both. Get out in front and protect the brand. So finally, rules are complex. We talked about just two of them. There's a that are out already. There are a bunch more coming that relate to imports and third parties and, and controls for animals and foreign supplier verification, transportation, voluntary importer program. The list goes on. We've got lots of things to look forward to. But these are now. They are complicated. And though they're proposed, as I said, more than once, I don't think they're going to change a whole lot. So take action today, if you haven't already. Program going in your facility to address FISMA along the lines that I've just outlined. The shift to 
towards documentation. And let technologies do some of the heavy lifting for you in that regard. I think if you do, you will protect the brand as much as you will be compliant with FDA's new requirements. I want to leave you with a quote. And this says, is my belief is that being in compliance is important to business continuity. Robust controls are important to business survival. This recognition of where we are today in the food business. Getting 83 from FDA isn't, it can make continuity. Preventive controls are inadequate, but to make people sick, you want business to worry about being compliant with. Barbara, I think I'm done. I'd like to hand back to you, and I look forward to some questions as soon as we're ready. That was very informative. Um, and uh, stay tuned because right now we're going to just give you a very high level overview about Safety Chain and how we can help you um, with your FISMA and other compliance challenges. And then we'll be taking your questions live. So, what I'm going to do while I'm doing this brief overview here, though, is to go out of full screen. Now, all of you should be able now to see at the bottom right-hand side of your screen the Q and box. You can just enter your questions there and hit send. We've already got quite a few, <clears throat> so uh, we'll get to those in a few minutes. It has affordable solutions that can help you prepare for FISMA while creating return on investment and value for you and all of your FSQ operations today. Um, our mission is really designed um, to help you prevent problems versus react to problems. And as is mentioned, prevention is really a, a core foundation um, of the Food Safety Modernization Act. Some things that we can help you do our automatic notifications of standard operating procedures, uh, CCPs, other parts of your food safety program, and then uh, real-time alerts if those are not being followed. The solution helps gather tests, test results electronically in real time. They can come on mobile devices uh, from people in the field or at the farm, from equipment on the production floor, obviously from suppliers, labs. Excuse me. And all of this information is gathered in real time and analyzed to specifications in real time. When there are deviations detected, automatic alerts go out for immediate correct actions to stop non-compliant ingredients from going into production in the first place. It also helps identify and then document before and after corrective actions. These are just a few of the many features. Um, but what these do for you is it helps you prevent, again, non-compliant ingredients from coming in and non-compliant finished products from going out. It helps speed shipping of compliant products. And it helps you create, most important, is a real-time automated central repository of unalterable time and date stamped FSQ data and information to help you be audit ready on demand whether that's an audit from the FDA, your customers, or any other party. These are all part of Safety Chain for Food. This is a solution that promotes food safety and quality assurance and ROI at all points along your supply chain. It helps you save time, save money, and create those compliance efficiencies. What does it help you enforce your safety and quality compliance standards? Eliminate manual process processes and errors, prevent withdrawal rejections and recalls, and protect your market value and brand, something very important as David just uh, mentioned to us. Because of the preventive focus of safety, think of it as your food safety smoke alarm in the sky. Think about setting a tool that helps you proactively prevent problems to monitor all of your safety and quality test results in real time so that you're getting a notification of a problem at the absolute earliest point possible versus then reactively uh, after the problem has already happened, trying to figure out how it started and how it's going to cost to repair the damage. Uh, and that's all I'm going 
going to tell you about Safety Chain because I know that we've got tons of questions. I'm going to put this slide up. We, we're going to stay and answer as many of, you, of your questions as we can. For those of you that do have uh, to leave at the top of the hour, let me answer some questions that I know you have um, before we get there. All of you will receive within 24 hours an email that will allow you to download the recording and the slides. Uh, you see some information up here to get more information on Levitt Partners to sign up for their free newsletter. And uh, even David, you're very brave. You put your email address up there. So um, for more information uh, from David or on Levitt, that, that information is there. For more information at, about Safety Chain for Food, you can just email us at info at. And uh, we've got some great events coming up. We've got a demo day of Safety Chain for Food, a case study with Dole Fresh Vegetables, and um, Responsibilities Along the Supply Chain and Preventative Approach is another webcast that we have coming, and you can register for these and other events at safetychain.com. And with that, let's start getting to some of these questions uh, that we have. We have a question from Greg um, for you, David. A distribution facility that handles seafood under a passive plan as well as many other products, I guess they are. When writing the food safety plan, do I exclude the seafood? Do I refer to it or do I include it? Great question. Um, my view that is, is that if the seafood that you're currently handling is subject to seafood HACCP facility, then you're exempt. Um, so that, that would be my view of it. If you're already controlling that risk through a HACCP program, that's the principle of what this is about. If you're controlling the risk using some other program, such as seafood HACCP or juice HACCP, um, or dietary subs through GMPs, then you're, you don't need to worry about a food safety plan for the particular commodity within your facility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nate is asking, warehouses handle allergens and pose a cross-contamination risk. Are they still exempt from the law if they handle allergens like soy flour, for example? Well, the reading of the proposed rule, as a way to interpret it, is that they would be. It's explicit that this is about time temperature control to control microbiological hazards in warehouses. They don't fit into time temperature or microbiological. So the, um, the assumption would, would be no, you, you're not expected to to allergens in your um, food plant. Now, you may say, whoa, that's, uh, that's a gap. That's a problem. Remember, this is a proposed rule, so that could tighten up with the final rule. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule that out, but certainly I don't think um, at the, 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 the fuse, the time temperature will stay in, that's for sure. But a very interesting point, but my interpretation of the rule as currently written is that would be excluded. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here. Um, lots of questions. How can we determine the severity of the illness when there are so many variables? Just assume the worst. <laughs> no, don't just assume the worst. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I think this is it's tough. Um, the, the sources out there to help, help you do that, the information to help you do that. Um, and I think it's a question of, of number one, what's what's the agent that is that you're worried about? What's the agent that you're asking questions about. Um, is it salmonella or is it listeria or is it E. coli 0157? Is it an allergen? Um, they clearly fall into class one to situations where, where, there's, where there is a reasonable probability of serious adverse health consequence. If there are other things, then it starts to fall lower on the list of, uh, of severity of illness. It's clearly not a black and white kind of operation. It's, it's got shades of gray as how severe is severe. The general approach that that, that I think uh, I would suggest people take is is certainly if it's a class one type deal, then that's a risk that you, you that is and reasonably likely to occur. Then that is one where I think the regulators would expect you to control it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Kat is asking, what does Dr. Atchison see as important steps for end use customers and print she has food services companies to require and validate of their suppliers? I'm a real advocate of supply chain control. They're protecting your brand by making sure what comes in through receiving is, is 
as safe for you as you can make it. For the end user, you're a, a retail or food service operation. You're heavily reliant on the safety and quality, obviously, of the products that are arriving in your facility. Um, my view on that is, is it would be um, an important strategy to understand the risks in your supply chain, looking at risks around products, looking at risks, risks around individual suppliers. Some products are inherently risky than others. Some suppliers are inherently less well operationally active, shall we say, um, than others. And I think you need to pay attention to that. So I think there is uh, there's leverage to be had for end users around this. But I'd also point out that it's not all about leverage in relation to compliance. It's about leveraging to protect the brand again. If you are the if you're the retailer and you're actually selling this directly to the consumer, them sick, they they may very likely come after you, even though it was purely a pass through, and thus your brand is in jeopardy. So it is incumbent upon you to protect the brand. And this is a compliance requirement for you, part of FISMA, but it's a brand protection that makes sense to totally understand the risk in your supply chain. Apply the appropriate resources to the extent of the risk, because we cannot control the supply chain equally, and nor should you, which is why it requires an assessment approach with, with sort of gradation of where's my highest risk, and that's where I'm going to put most of my energy. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few uh, more questions, and we're going to get to as many of them as we can. I'm getting some notes from people that um, are, have other uh, meetings at the top of the hour and uh, asking questions. Again, um, you will get an email about uh, that will let you uh, download both the slides and the recording. And I do want to uh, mention that this is the first in a series of FISMA-related webcasts and papers that Safe Chain and Levitt Partners will be um, holding, and uh, all of you that are registered um, for for this will get invitations to those if there's others in your company that you think should be added to our list. Um, simply send us their names at info at Safety Chain. Um, if you are leaving us right now, thank you so much. We hope you found today's event um, informative, and again, you'll be receiving information as we as we hold more and more drill down events. And for those of you that are still on, um, we're going to get through as many of these questions as we can. I think, um, uh, David, that you said you can stay on for a few minutes after the top of the hour, so we'll just continue to run down these. Just saying, I can't get my head around the notion that there are, and he's putting the word requirements in quotes, in the produce rule, but there's no mandatory oversight. FDA is only going after those farms that have a recall, then won't you be back to the post facto response uh, with no real verified change? change. Well, um, I think there's a little misunderstanding there. Um, what the, the produce rule is a mandate for certain growers. Uh, if, you, if you grow food that is likely to be consumed raw, and I'm simply at some, and you have a certain size in terms of a grower, in, t in sales and volume, then you will be mandated to pay attention to those areas that I talked about, like agricultural water quality, uh, worker hygiene equipment, animals, etc., soil amendments. So the mandate is not reactive to recalls. I think where the, where, where the question is, is going, I don't know, maybe I'm reading sideways into it, but the big, the big guys are going to be mandated. The size, no. Um, definitely, uh, in the proposed rule, that if you're a small guy and you're exempt and you have a problem, then FDA can change the rules on you and require you to do these things, which is the reactive trigger. That's part. I want to basically take that misunderstanding off the table. This is not all reactive. There are definitely um, businesses of the growing industry that will have to do this. It does raise a concern that small growers are exempt of the economic consequences. You know the challenges around that. that that's very clear. Um, but, but many in the growing industry recognize that just because you're small doesn't mean that you don't have a problem. Um, and I do see this as as little of, a, of an Achilles heel in terms of protecting the public adequately 
from these rules. We've got a big mixed scenario here. Um, the argument is that if you're big, you're going to get more people sick, and it's it, that's the logic. Uh, does everybody agree with it? Not necessarily. Um, so a little bit of a of a of a, of a change message. But I, think, um, I certainly wouldn't leave, want to leave anybody on, on the webinar with the misunderstanding that I've got to have had an event in order to have to be compliant. No. If you're up if you're a certain size, you go, you got to do this if you're producing certain types of raw agricultural products. Um, if you're below size, not so much, and, and then there will be a reaction if you get out of line. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a mixed message, but um, hopefully that's addressed the question, Barbara. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, from Bob, if you have a deviation in a non-CCP process control, for example, an environmental swab is positive for listeria, will all products produced within the scope of that deviation, back to the less negative swab, be considered adulterated until proven otherwise? You know, it's so going to be dependent on your testing plan and your corrective action strategy. and Frankly, with the testing plan, where you've taken that swab from. If you're swabbing zone two, three, four for listeria and you find a problem, that doesn't necessarily trigger that scenario where you've got product on hold or you're doing a recall. You do a zone one testing for listeria species or listeria monotogenes, and you you find a positive. We all know what that means. Uh, it can have it can have major consequences if an FDA regulated facility. Unlike SIS, they don't have the opportunity for one one positive, and you're just supposed to learn from it. One positive, and you definitely are in some bother. Um, and obviously, if you are doing that, you want to have a test and hold. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be advocating zone one testing for listeria or listeria species for an environmental perspective, or salmonella for that matter, if you didn't have the capacity to test and hold. Control your risk with zone two, three, and four. Um, but the principle that is that's been the principle that FDA has operated under for a long time is that you'd be going back to the point where you last sanitized and could demonstrate that the problem was not there. Um, that changed in these rules, so I think you need to be very circumspect about how you control the risk. Think about where you're testing, what you're testing, and how controlling it. And I would far rather you blitz zone two and three and four than get off into trouble by doing zone one and not having the capacity to hold a short shelf life product. That is asking for a problem. Thanks. Asking, if the facility is certified under a GFSI benchmark standard, how long are they from being compliant with preventive controls? They are probably a good, a good way along. Um, I, I There's a lot in the GFSI schemes that are aligned with the preventive controls. Uh, I think it's a little bit too early yet to say how perfect that alignment is. I suspect there are certain aspects of the GFSI that go beyond preventive control requirements, maybe certain aspects of the preventive control requirements that go beyond GFSI. So as of today, if you're GFSI certified, my belief is you, you are going to be in a good place. You're going to be in a, in a better place than if you haven't been through that, that process. Having said that, I expect we will see some gaps. And my belief is that the schemes um, that are responsible for the GFSI standards, the BRD, SQF, FSC 22000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will, will quickly identify these gaps. They will plug them so that effectively the two are running in parallel. I think that's what FDA would like. It makes sense for the industry so that it's one system. Uh, but I think perhaps right now you may may not be quite where you need to be, but you're going to be in a pretty good place. Thank you. Uh, Susan is asking, I, think, um, I know you, hello Susan, <laughs> is there a good place to find information about sampling plans for monitoring for bacterial contamination? Oh, what a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the answer to that is yes, but as off the top of my head, to direct somebody to a website that's got um, a roast outline sampling plans, I don't instantly know one, but I, I would suggest I guess that's something that we should look into and perhaps um, through through your system is find some way to post it or to let people know when we found 
mentioned it. Um, I know mm-hmm. right off the top of my head, um, one that I can say, oh, yes, go to this site. It's got great sampling plan information. I know they're out there. I'm a sampling plan expert, so I'm just being a bit a bit awkward in terms of actually giving you the specific reference to that. But it's a really good question because um, that's going to be important. I mean, there's certainly there's plenty of science. There's the ICMSF-type documents where sampling plans are well laid out, but, but they're complicated. They're hard to read. Um, I least think they are. Um, and, and what we want is kind of the uh, um, simple guide to, a, to an effective sampling plan. I know that exists. It probably does, but I just don't know where it is. But let me do that as a bit of homework and see if I can't find one. All right. Thank you. Um, it is the top of the hour. Um, we're going to just uh, go for a little longer here and see if we can get through as many of these questions as we can. Vicki's uh, saying, I import products. The manufacturing facility is registered. Do their suppliers mm-hmm. need to be registered? No. The registration requirement is, and this is a Bioterrorism Act requirement, it's not a FISMA requirement. The Bioterrorism Act requirement requires a manufacturing firm who is exporting product into the United States to be registered. It does require their suppliers to be registered, but the manufacturing facility. So if you've got a manufacturing facility making a bar of some sort, a health bar, using 15 different ingredients, of the, of the health bar, protein bar, if coming directly into the United States, they need to be registered. They need to be compliant with all of these new rules. Their suppliers do not. So it was one step back. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nikki, will, the be, will, will, will there be anything new at the border? Only yes, the will. Um, that part of this rule been talking about, but there are pieces that are going to, at least two pieces that are going to impact border activities. The first is something called the Foreign Supply Verification Program. This is a rule that is currently sitting under review um, in, in the administration. It's not, it, we don't know the details yet, yet, but what it is in essence doing is putting the burden of everything that we've been talking about on, on importers. Importers will have the responsibility to ensure that the foods they are importing are compliant with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. That means they're compliant with the preventive control rules. That means they're compliant with the produce rules. That's a burden on importers. In terms of at the border that go beyond that, there is another program called the Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, which we don't know about very much, but to me this is a really important part of FISMA, anybody who's... who's um, who uses imported finished products or ingredients to be aware of. Because effectively what this is doing, it's going to create a system whereby if the foreign, the exporter, is compliant with this program, and it's called Entry Qualified Importer Program, if compliant with it, they get in the quick lane of the country. For those who travel and who doesn't these days, is analogous to TSA's pre-screening program. When you show up at the airport and if you're with that program, you go through the line a whole lot quicker and you don't have to take your laptop out or take yours off. Or an international traveler and you're familiar with global entry, you have gone through some vetting, some some interviews, and you get through the immigration line in two minutes as opposed to two hours. That's the principle of VQIP, Voluntary Qualified Importer Program. I believe that this will look like Actually, the basic requirements that we've talked about, plus something. There's going to be an extra carrot. There's going to be an extra need to get uh, listed for VQIP. There's going to be a role with party auditors in ensuring that you meet the requirements. There's going to be a small fee associated with it. And I say small because FDA is allowed to charge for the cost of administering this program, but not to make money out of it. So the fee. Um, but a lot more to come on that. I probably in 2014, I'm guessing, maybe later this year. So the answer is yes, there will be, um, and it's going to be important for anybody importing food or food ingredients under FDA control to to be from that, and obviously uh, to use companies that, that have access to this quick channel in. point that I think that will be part of is that should you get stopped, like all of these programs, there's always the possibility that you'll get stopped, then FDA has said they will expedite 
inspections, they will ex expedite testing, and they will minimize the impact of a hold at the port of entry. So to me, this is a really important program for, for business survival and for shipment. Um, to come on that, probably, as I say, probably this year or 2014. Thank you. I was asking specifically, how will FISMA change your needs for raw material supplier monitoring prerequisite programs? You know, the, the proposed rule right now, uh, this is down to supply chain control, which gets a little bit back to some of the, the, the earlier question that we had from food service. The Food Modernization Act, um, gave, um, they gave FDA the authority to require manufacturing processes to um, ascend to the extent possible control of their risks in the supply chain. Um, that's in the law. FDA didn't actually exercise that authority and put it in the proposed rule. My belief, and it's again, this is just an Atchison perspective, is is that that will be in the final rule. The FDA wants that to be in there. I think the sectors of the industry that want that to be in there, and I suspect it will be in there. It's absolutely good brand protection management. It's good, it's good prems to manage these raw ingredients coming in. Um, so I think I think it'll go there. But but right now it's not it's not a mandate. There isn't a requirement to do that. That's definitely a space to watch where it could kick in. And then we'll have to look at the language and interpret precisely what does that mean in relation to the question for raw ingredients. Um, and if those raw ingredients are going to be further processed by you to take care of microbial or other hazards, it's a non-issue, and you don't need to worry about it. So uh, I think this is a space to watch. Okay, great. Uh, Jennifer is, is uh, saying, asking, if we're, if we're not supposed to give out FDA registration number, how do we confirm our suppliers are registered? Can't anyone say they're registered? <laughs> um, well, you are not supposed to give out your registration number for, for essentially for bioterrorism purposes. That's absolutely right. Um, to be honest with you, if you are receiving goods from, from a supplier, and you think they should be registered, about all you can do is to say, are you registered? You hope that this is an affirmative if you think that they should be. But at that point, they could make it up. But for whether they're registered or not with FDA is moot in terms of what risk do they do they, uh, do they to for you as a supplier to your facility. And you should be asking them based on that as a first principle. Forget whether they're registered or not. That's their business. It's not your business. If, if you if you are sourcing something from them and they are a manufacturing facility and you're sourcing a finished ingredient from them that you're using in a, in a product, the selling straight, or you're using it in a product that you're not going to further thermally process, then you absolutely want to be sure that their thermal processing is adequate. If that's if kill step in the in the medical product that we're talking about is irrelevant of whether they need to register or not. That's you doing smart business with your suppliers. So it matters that they can't share their registration number with you. Um, it, it's actually more, there are more important things to worry about than their registration number in terms of controlling risk. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Um, how are you uh, for time? Do you have time for a few more? I'm probably good for maybe another five five minutes, Barbara. Okay, well, we'll get a few more, and uh, as I said, this is the first in a series, so if we didn't get to your question this time, we will we will try to get to it uh, the, the next time. Uh, let's see. Um, Lars is asking, is food packaging in the scope of the preventive control rule? No. I don't think so. Um, packaging... I, that, that's a very dogmatic statement. Um, I, I, there is an expectation that if during your hazard analysis you believe that the packaging introduces a risk that's reasonably likely to occur, which I think is unlikely, because otherwise why would you be using that as a packaging? Um, and the answer might be yes. Uh, but generally speaking, packaging is not is not really covered in anywhere in FISMA. Um, it, it's relevant to controlling risk. It, it's relevant to a variety of 
things, but the, but the, the references to packaging are pretty peripheral. Um, but our packaging companies can do a lot to understand where where manufacturers are facing some pain around compliance with FSMA and general brand protection, things that help alleviate that. And companies that understand some of those pain points and risks for, for food companies, even though they may not have to do a whole lot, are just going to be in a better place to sell their products to manufacturers. So it's important that packaging companies understand what this is about and, and, and be part of the solution. But um, I, I don't think there's a, there's a things that they're going to have to do different from the way they operate today. Okay. She's asking, I'm moving my dry grocery products to a beverage warehouse. Are they required to meet these regulations as well? Nope. If they are dry grocery products that don't require time temperature control for calling risk, then my read of the rule, the proposed rule right now is no, they don't. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Angel is asking, is tree fruit, such as apples, pears, and cherries, considered ready to eat fruit? Yes. Okay. Um, FDA did not differentiate between types of raw actual products that are considered ready to eat. Um, they basically put spinach, lettuce, leafy greens in the same bucket as apples and tree fruit. Um, I think that, obviously, per this question, is probably going to cause some consternation with the tree fruit growers because they're going to say, our risk is significantly less. Why do we have to do all the lifting? That's a good reason for comment back to FDA. But right now, my interpretation of those produce rules is, is that, uh, yeah, they would have to be compliant in the same way as anybody else who's growing a raw agricultural product that is not for the process. Okay. Fabulous. Um, I, I know that there are quite a few people um, who did not get their questions answered. We literally have hundreds and hundreds of people on today, um, and uh, we just took them in order. So if, if you didn't get your questions answered, um, we apologize. We encourage you to uh, join um, our future FISMA events that we'll be holding again uh, with uh, Levitt Partners and Dr. Atchison. Um, and with that, I want to thank you, David, so much um, for this very informative webcast. I uh, would also <clears throat> like to thank everybody for attending. We hope to see you online at another uh, webcast soon, some of the ones that you see here. And again, um, this is the first in a series of FISMA-related events. Um, we will capture your questions, and hopefully we can get to those the next time. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.